high delta function, a real sharp peak of probability, because you've got the record. It's in the system. So historical, um, you know, staying within uh, in the, what historic um, demands would make that beer have to be there just like the picture, unless, of course, your guy's stealing your beer, but then you'd know for sure. <laughs> anyway, if you don't, if it is just you and your memory, instead of that sharp probability, you have this big kind of broad probability because there may be four, there may be three, there may be two, there may not be any. And when it takes that sample out of that probability function, it might just get zero or it might get six or it might get three. Okay, so you open that door, you make a measurement, the wave function collapses to a physical state and there's a certain number of beer in that refrigerator and that's what you get. Now, because the system can do multiple solutions, it can manipulate that to nudge you. And that's where synchronicity comes from. That's also where all these anomalous things come on. How many of you have put your, your glasses or your keys or something someplace? They left them on my desk. You come back four hours later or next day, and they're not on your desk. And you find them, you know, in your bedroom or someplace, and you knew you didn't leave them there. You know, how many times do things like that happen to you? Well, these anomalies aren't necessarily because you're just getting old and can't remember where you left things. <laughs> Sometimes that's just the system. The system may not know exactly where you left it because there's no data, because the probability function is broad, and when you make the measurement, it's just not there. So you live in a very flaky reality, you see. But it'll only do that when there's enough uncertainty that there is no violation of either the rule set or of the consistency of the history. Okay, and we'll see how this plays out in the next slide or two. Um, okay, so what about the synchronicity? So you look in the refrigerator and there just happens to be no beer because the system wants to nudge you a little bit. So you go get in your car, you drive down to the neighbor grocery store, and you're driving in the parking lot, and you drive right by this empty space, and you say, okay, I'll you drive by it, and you go to back in it. You start to back up, and just about the time you expect you'll be entering a space, you turn around and look, and just as you look, crunch, you hit a car. And you look back there and say, where did that car come from, right? Where did that come from? It wasn't there. I just looked. And then you think, somebody, some jerk just pulled into that space just as I was backing into it. So you look again, and there's nobody in the car. You say, boy, they must have been fast. <laughs> so you get out, and you walk around to the car, and you look, and you see, well, there's really no damage. You're going very, very, very slow. And there's no damage. And about that time, you look up, and here's somebody coming out of the, coming out of the store with two bags of groceries, obviously, you know, had been in there a while, and that's their car. So they look out, and you both look at the thing and say, well, there isn't any damage. And then what happens? That person turns out to be your soulmate. You get married. That person turns out to offer you a job. That person turns out to invite you to their, their meditation class, and it changes your life. You know, that person and so on, right? This is synchronicity. Things just happened. And no beer in the refrigerator went to the grocery store, went to the car that wasn't supposed to be there, ran into the person that changed your life or was very meaningful or turned you on to a particular book or whatever it is. That's how the system works synchronicity. It's that uncertainty gives it the ability to manipulate you and nudge you. And it can do that as long as it doesn't violate those two principles. It's a statistical reality. We don't live in a objective reality. If I had time, I could, I could explain to you why objectivity is only an approximation. We live in a statistical, probabilistic reality. Quantum mechanics tells us that. We just don't believe it because we don't know what to do with it. But that's the way our reality is. All right, next. Now we're going to use this knowledge to solve some problems. Okay, the appearance, the false appearance of backward causality. Now this isn't the, the, the the experiment I'm going to give you follows what actually happened, but isn't what actually happened, because I'm just giving you a, a kind of character of it that makes it easy to understand. Okay, imagine 20,000 hospital records. These hospital records go back, say, over two decades. Two decades of people coming out of a hospital. You're going to take those 20,000 records, you're going to break them into 20 groups of 1,000, randomly separate them into 20 groups of 1,000. Then each group of 1,000, you're going to randomly break into two groups of 500. One of those groups of 500 is a control group. The other group, you're going to use your intent to improve the health of those people that are in that one group of 500. Okay, now this was done, first one that I know of that was done was done in, in Israel, and I think it was a group of rabbis and others who uh, prayed for these people or otherwise used their intent for their good health. 
Well, what they found out was that group that they had prayed for and used their intent to make them healthier, they had statistically significantly lower hospital stays, you know, shorter hospital stays than did the control group. Statistically significant. Well, you know, that means that, uh, you know, there was only uh, probably a 10% or less probability that that actually could happen that way. Well, that's not that amazing. You know, things that are only 10% probability happen every day. But then they did the same with the next group and the next group and the next group. And eventually they had all 20 groups. Every one of them that they had prayed for and used their intent on had shorter hospital stays than the control group, the other 500. All right, now the first one was interesting, but not miraculous. 20 in a row, now you're talking about one in a million. That's like flipping a coin 20 times and getting his heads every time. Hard to do by accident. Okay, so this is the conclusion they came to is that somehow they were affecting the health of these people in the past because this data was old. This wasn't current data. This was old data. That's called reverse causality. This experiment is done a lot of different ways. It's been done over and over. It's been done in Princeton. It's been done uh, lots of places, not necessarily with, with patients. It's done with radioactive isotope, where they take a radioactive isotope that's decaying. They take two Geiger counters. Each Geiger counter should, should over time, get roughly the same number of counts, because when it decays, it decays in any particular direction. Uh, then they take this data, and years later, they'll have people bias the results such that, say, the, the Geiger counter on the right gets significantly more counts than the one on the left. They have a little pair lab, they have a little robot, and that robot is given a random motion in the four directions. So they put it down in the middle of a big circular table and they let it just wander around. And they can let it wander around for days and it never leaves, you know, maybe about a square foot box where it just wanders around at the center of the table because it's random motion. So you get as much going one direction as the other and it doesn't go anywhere. The person applies their intent to it, that little robot walks across the table and falls off the edge. Now these are experiments that have literally been hundreds of times under immaculate protocol and uh, scientific uh, inspection. So this is a, a, uh, a fact that happens. Okay, why does it happen? Well, obviously, they're modifying reality, right? But are they affecting these patients 20 years ago? Of course not. What are they measuring? They're measuring the data. They're measuring that data of those hospital patients, those hospital stays is what they're measuring. And they're biasing that data because that data hasn't been brought into this reality yet. Nobody's looked at that data. So that data is still in the future. I mean, the, the statistical results of that data are still in the future. Nobody's ever calculated them. And because it's still in the future, it's just probability, like everything else that's in the future. It only exists in probability. And like everything that exists in probability, conscious intent can modify the probability. So that's how they do that. Now, let's say that somebody um, takes that data, and before it's given to the rabbis, they do a statistical analysis of what's in both pieces, the, this 500 and that 500, right? They do the statistical analysis, and they know exactly what those hospitals, average hospital stays are in both groups. They give it to the rabbis to work on, and they worked on it, and they worked on it, and of course the rabbis didn't know that this had been done. Guess what? They couldn't do it. They couldn't bias it one bit. It just didn't work. Why? Once the data's here, there's historical precedence. It has to stay here. You can't change it. That would be against the rule set. It wouldn't be coherent history. All right, now what if they just, before they gave it to the, radar, the rabbis, they just looked at the statistics for the whole set of 1,000, but not the two individual groups of 500, and then give it to the rabbis? Would the rabbis be able to do it? Yes, but guess what else would happen? As much as the group that they prayed for went to shorter hospital stays, the other group would have to go an equal amount to longer hospital stays because they have a constraint now that they didn't have before. And I don't know that they've ever done that experiment, but if they did, that's the way it would have to come out because that's the way this works. Okay? So if you just looked at the whole 20,000 and did statistics on that, then yes, you could bias things, but again, now you have a constraint. And you have to meet that constraint because now that data is in this reality frame. All right, let's take another example. Let's say that they took this data and they did measure all the groups of 500 and they knew exactly what the statistics were on all of them and they put that in a drawer and that building caught fire and the data went away. All right, now 
They can pull that data back out of another computer someplace where it's still never, the statistics haven't been done in the computer. They just were done once and no record was kept except what was in that drawer. And the guy who did it, well, choose, you know, there was.